Yeah, we'll be ready to go when our speaker uh, rejoins us. But what do you think, Allison, about uh, taking our speaker's state expertise and focusing it on Percy, for example, and just I love our, that idea. Our attendees could see how they can look for information in, in the periodical source index, and maybe we can tag team that. I think that sounds fantastic. Do you want me to share screen? Sure. All right, guys, we're going to take a look at Percy for a moment. Um, for those of you that are just joining us, it is 2.30 and typically our program would be getting started. But unfortunately, our speaker is in a building where the fire alarms went off and she had to evacuate. She will be back as soon as possible. But until then, we are going to tap dance around Alabama and kind of see what we can find. <laughs> this Absolutely. is live programming. <laughs> So we're going to go to our website, which is genealogycenter.org, and go to Percy, Periodical Source Index. Now, the reasons we want to show you this is because there's so many hidden little gems that you may not find otherwise. Something that I like to tell people when they come in in person is that these periodicals, these journals, quarterlies, newsletters, these are done by people who are boots on the ground in the location where you are looking for information. And maybe that's not where you live. I've seen a lot of people say in the chat where they're from, and you guys are from all over the United States, not necessarily Alabama, but you're in this presentation either because you have Alabama ancestors or you're interested in the research methods. Either way, let's discuss how to find some stuff. Before you get to that, Allison, if I could interrupt just for a brief moment, uh, for those who may not know what the periodical source index is, I think, Allison, you gave a great intro. And if I, if I could just add on to that, uh, for basically a generation, our team here at the Allen County Public Library's Genealogy Center, we have been subject indexing literally tens of thousands of issues of periodicals. And as Allison was saying, um, it's sort of your eyes into a place where you want to do research or you think that you have family. So I like to tell people you use books before computers. We used a lot of microfilm. Some of us still use microfilm for things that aren't online. So we use books and microfilm and online. If we're not using periodicals in our genealogical research, we could be missing up to 25 to 30 percent of available information for our search for, for our ancestors. So I can't stress enough, we're so excited this year because we're able to offer Percy for free. It used to be we would partner with an information aggregator and we partnered with almost all of them and all the big ones in the space and it would be behind a paywall. Now it's completely free. You can search it any time of day you want and we're gonna focus on searching Alabama, right, Allison? Yes, yes. And also I like to say my favorite four letter word is free. Yeah. <laughs> right. Percy is now part of that. So one thing you can do is go by location. And that's what we're going to do an example of today. I'm going to go ahead and click on United States. And then we're going to go to Alabama. Now, this is where you can do a couple different things. You can just hit search and it's going location by Alabama. And when I do that, it's going to bring up all of the Alabama resources. And so it's going to go by category at that point. So you kind of need. And <laughs> I'm sorry, Allison, I, I'm just kind of geeky. Look at all those subject headings. There are standard record subject headings, but there's also location subject headings. And you saw what Allison did. And in what, two and a half seconds, three seconds, these thousands of Alabama articles came up and you just click on the geographic area, the record type, whatever subject you're interested in, and you'll get all of those results. That's to me, that's amazing. Thousands of articles are right at our fingertips right now. Yes, and once you open it up, okay, so this, this looks like a very high number. This looks daunting, but I'm gonna click on it and show you that it's not quite as daunting you have a couple options of filters once you get in. You can do a search within the results and say, let's say we're looking, okay, this is, um, we're in court records, we're in Alabama. Let's say we want specifically maybe, 
probate. So I can type start typing probate and it's going to specifically bring up just probate. So there's a probate judge, probate cases, et cetera. So you have a bunch of different options here. So could you continue going down to the bottom there, Allison? Yeah. Uh, this is what I think is so powerful. So we had 1,335 entries and Allison put in probate and it's now down to nine entries, just like that. As she was typing, it got narrower and narrower and narrower. So if you're looking for, um, maybe there's a surname in there. Maybe there's uh, Williams or Williamson. If you start typing W-I-L, it continues to shrink and shrink and shrink until you get to a result set that you're interested in and that's small enough for you to peruse. So I, I just think even though there's not a field where you can do true Boolean or wildcard, this search box here really helps you narrow a large search result set as, as you just saw from what Allison did. And you'll notice that we're getting the article titles. I really wanna reiterate, we are indexing the article titles. There's not necessarily an article that's going to list all of your ancestors and that's fine. You just need to be creative about what you're looking for. So if you're looking for a death of some sort, a death event, think about all the death event things that could be in, in an article. So you could be looking for funeral. I don't see any right there. We could be looking for death. Oh, yikes. I'm starting to type death and I'm getting death and dead. Do you see how there's different words that could be in there? Another thing you could do is wills or will singular, uh, you could do probate, which I already did, um, hmm. cemetery, yep. there's that, yep. grave, awesome. So there's a lot of different words that you could be looking for around a specific event in your ancestor's life that maybe come up within here. So make sure that you're being very creative and trying to figure out, okay, if there's an article about this specific thing, what would it be? Right, right. Um, your point that you made just a few moments ago um, is a really good one, Allison. Uh, sometimes, and um, we'll take our dings for this, for those people who might get exercised about it, but this isn't an every name index. It's called the periodical source index because it's subject index to articles. So we don't have indexers working 24 seven indexing all the names and all the proper nouns out of the articles. We're just categorizing, and I shouldn't say just, we're categorizing these thousands upon thousands upon hundreds of thousands of articles by their subject. Once you get to the article, then you can search for the name, the proper noun, the church, the cemetery, whatever it is that you're specifically looking for. So this is to get you to those, those journals and, and those articles. Uh, so I, I know some people, when they initially hear index, they think, goody, I'll put in my surname, I'll put in Witcher, and I'll get everything everywhere in Witcher. It's like, well... Not unless Witcher is in every single title of every single article you'll want. And we know that's not true because we know we do a lot of geographically based searching. So um, just want to make that point. Don't want to beat it to death, but just want to make the point. It's a subject index, not an every name index. But as you were watching Allison work her magic, narrowing down that search results, you just start typing in it and it starts to narrow things. So um, it's, it's really very powerful. Um, I didn't know if you were going to cover this, Allison, but at the top, article title, periodical, year published, publisher, along those uh, top headings, there's a little drop down. I call it a drop down arrow, but it's really an ascendancy and descendancy arrow where you can order the periodicals alphabetically. You can order the year published chronologically or reverse. Same thing with publisher. So when you are looking in Alabama, which is our topic for today, and you do a search on like probate records and you see 
1,300 of them, you can glance over and order your periodicals alphabetically. And maybe you'll find a periodical like Valley Leaves or Alabama Heritage that you're familiar with. And you can say, oh, I want to see all the articles in that. So you can line up those periodical titles in alphabetical order. Yes. And I don't know if you guys noticed, but I also um, filtered by county. So I'm in Lawrence County, Alabama court records, and there are still 136 entries for one county. So you want to make sure to play around with this. And yeah, if you know that it's in a specific periodical, you can play around with those. Your published publisher, or in this case, you could then search within this specific county um, and see what you can find for sale. So you could go with the share sale. Uh, let's see here, we could do probate again. Nope, no probate, duh, nope. What else could there be? Oh, bond for jail contract. I like that, that looks interesting. I'd wanna play with that one. And something that you guys can note, once you get one of these up and you see this and you're like, okay, this is the article I want to look at. My ancestor was probably in jail during this time period in this location. How do I get this article? Kurt, how did they get this article? Well, there are three really interesting ways. Um, I'll save the third one, which you would expect to be the first one until we get to the third one. But the first best way, and that's why um, we include all the information about publisher uh, and title and call number in each line, what Allison just highlighted. So over on the right-hand side, the first best thing to do is to contact the publisher. They will more quickly answer your question, and they may be able to provide you with even more information than just that periodical. So contacting the publisher, we don't have web addresses, as you saw, but you saw what Allison just did. Copy the title, paste it into your favorite uh, search engine, and you'll get the, the society. And you can contact them directly. Most societies, particularly as we have you know, navigated this challenging COVID time, are really anxious to communicate with members and potential members. Uh, so they're pretty quick to respond. So look up the... Um, the organization and Allison's looking around there. It now looks like they're open some days. So you'd want to contact them. Right. Most societies, not all, but most of them have a website and an email address and some other um, more immediate information than just sending them an email. But if you have to send them an email, send, send them an email. So that's way number one is go over to the right-hand side of the citation in Percy and see if you can't Google that to contact them. Worst comes to worst, maybe you'll have to use postal mail. I know we do little of that these days, but it is, it is an opportunity. The second way, it, it, it's a great new resource. We could do an hour long program on that and have in the past is to use WorldCat. Put in the title of the periodical in WorldCat and WorldCat will show you libraries closest to your zip code. And so Allison's searching that in WorldCat and you click on that and then you have an opportunity to put in your zip code and we put in ours, uh, 46802. And these are the two libraries that are in WorldCat that have a copy of that journal. Now they're not close to us. One's in Oklahoma, one's in California. Um, there's multiple right. copies of this. So one of the things you have to remember is different places name things differently. So with periodicals, occasionally you'll find multiple entries. So right. here's three more. So this one, they added a journal. Right. Um, different entities, as you were saying, Allison, do catalog things differently. Um, some people use cover title and call that good enough. Some people use the the complete title, but could, could you land on one of those, um, Allison? Sure. And so you can see as she scrolls down to the find a copy in a library. So there's three libraries. Notice as you go across that screen to print formats, um, 
when you have a link in that held formats column, you can sometimes click on that and get right into that library's catalog for that entity. Right there you go. Don't be disappointed if you can't get this, if it comes back with a 404 error or some of those old tired uh, web browser errors. That just means their catalog has changed or Lincoln has changed. Then in WorldCat, you can go all the way over to the right-hand side and engage their Ask a Librarian service. Um, so if we go back, go back to the previous WorldCat screen, notice all the way over there, it says library info, then Ask a Librarian. You can put your question in here and say, hey, I'm interested in this volume, this issue of the journal, or you can, as Allison highlighted, chat with a librarian right now. Hey, I'd like to get a copy of this article. How, how, how can I do that? And again, most organizations are um, very happy to let you know what the process is for getting, getting a copy. So that's the second way. First way, email, contact the society. Second way is to use WorldCat to find a library close to you. The third way is to contact the Allen County Public Library's Genealogy Center. Uh, we have every single periodical that we've indexed. Um, I would dare say, and I, I hope I'm right, Allison, you, you let me know if I'm going to uh, braggadocious here, but we have one of the largest genealogy and historical periodical collections in the entire world related to genealogy. So everything in Percy will be in the genealogy center here. Everything that's indexed in Percy will be in the genealogy center. And you can link to uh, an article order form and you can fill this form out after you have printed it. We're in the process of trying to update the process. How's that for double speak? The process of updating the process. Uh, so it's a little bit easier to do online um, requests for periodicals. Why did I put the Genealogy Center third? All three are really viable, great options for trying to obtain an article. But I put the Genealogy Center third because we get a lot of requests. So it can take a number of weeks. That's right, weeks, not days, not hours, but weeks for us to fulfill the, the request. So um, you might need a little a little thimble full of patience if you uh, engage the, the Genealogy Center, but you will, you will get copies if you do write to us. And I guess, Allison, there's like a, a 3.1 option as well. You could like come visit us. We are not opposed to that at all. So for the people who are near us in Ohio and Michigan, and other people who maybe aren't so near to us, um, Hope this also doesn't sound too braggadocious, but Fort Wayne is a great town to visit. Uh, we just had a convention of travel journalists here over the weekend. Um, great town for us um, and a great town for you to visit. So contact the society, use worldcat.org, it's free. Contact the Genealogy Center through the website and come visit us. So there's an awful, an awful lot of ways that you can get copies of the articles that you might find of interest. Yes, and I just highlighted something that people have asked. There's a couple of questions about the cost. So yes, there is a cost. It is not cheap for us to have the manpower to make the copies and then physically um, make the copies on the paper, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, there is a cost. It is pretty reasonable. It's $7.50 for each order form. And then it's um, 20 cents per page copied and billed to you. So just kind of give you an idea of that. And hey, look who's back. Hey guys, sorry. I'm a little out of breath because I sprinted. <laughs> No worries, no Back worries. Back to my cubicle. Um, so that was not a that was not a drill. That was an actual fire alarm. Um, I'm fairly certain there wasn't fire. We've had some. Um, we've had the alarm company in and kind of kind of doing some work on the system, and so uh, they they weren't like expecting it to go off, but it did. So anyway, but I think we're all good now. Okay, <laughs> sorry good. about glad that. You're safe. No, no, you're fine. We're we're very glad that you're safe and. All is well. We just um, tried to, in our humble way, focus on Alabama, but just talk about other resources like the Periodical Source Index. So okay. we just kind of teed up your presentation. Yeah. So, All uh, right. Well, 
okay, fingers crossed. No more of that. No more of that's going to happen today. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, Courtney, I'm so glad that you're safe and you're back. Are you ready to go? Yes. Yep. Awesome. I, I mean, barring another fire alarm, I think I'm good. <laughs> All right. If anything else happens, just let us know. But Hey, everybody. Um, We are so glad to have Courtney joining us. Um, She is the reference coordinator for the Alabama Department of Archives and History. And I'm just going to turn it over to her now since we're a little bit running. I don't know, not behind. Just it's a weird schedule today. So Courtney, take it away. All right. So uh, I am Courtney Pinkard. I am the coordinator of reference at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. I'm super excited to be with you guys today and uh, sorry for the delay. But, um, but we're, we're here and rolling now. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about Alabama and about the um, Alabama Department of Archives and History and just sort of generally, and then we're actually gonna go into focus on some specific resources that we have available here for genealogy researchers. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna, we're gonna look at um, the history of Alabama very broad strokes, um, just to kind of, if you're not familiar with Alabama and sort of the the major beats of like migration into and out of Alabama, I always think this is kind of helpful to think about when you are um, starting your genealogy. Um, so with that being said, let's see if I can advance my slides here. Okay, okay. Yeah, there we go. Just a little bit of a delay. Um, all right. So the first Alabamians. Um, Alabama was first inhabited by Native Americans of the Mississippian culture, and they were known for their impressive city complexes that were dotted with these large earthen mounds. They first had contact with Europeans in the 1500s, and this contact decimated their population. It would take many decades for the um, scattered survivors of that contact to rebound. And when they did, they formed the groups or tribes that we're most familiar with today, which would be the Creeks, the Choctaws, and the Cherokees. The Creeks were the largest group in what would become the state of Alabama, followed by the Choctaws in the extreme western part of the state on the Mississippi line, and then the Cherokees in the extreme northeastern corner of the state near Tennessee. Alabama was originally part of the Mississippi Territory, and when Mississippi joined the Union in 1817, it was split off and given its own territorial status. Alabama became a state in its own right in 1819. The cession of native lands to the federal government, which started in the 18 teens and then continued through the 1820s and 1830s, opened the newly formed state of Alabama to white settlement. By 1838, all of our tribes had been removed to Indian Territory in Oklahoma, with only a few scattered and isolated remnant communities left behind. White settlers poured into these newly acquired lands from states like Georgia, the Carolinas, and Tennessee. Of course, it didn't take very long for those who were hungry for more land and opportunity to shift their eyes to the West. And by the later half of the 19th century, Alabamians were starting to strike out for states like Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas, and points beyond. The next major shift in population began around the turn of the century with the Great Migration, African American families seeking to escape the harsh, con harsh conditions in the South and hopeful for new economic opportunities left the state in large numbers to settle in places like Detroit, Chicago, and Indianapolis. We have many researchers from the North and West that eventually find their way back to Alabama. Next, we'll briefly cover the history of our archive, and then we'll talk about some of the specific resources we have to offer. In 1901, Alabama established the first publicly funded independent Department of Archives and History in the United States, predating the creation of the National Archives by more than 30 years. Under the direction of Thomas McAdery Owen, uh, our first director, Office space for the archives was set up in the old Senate cloakroom in the state capitol, and that is actually what's pictured here. Tom immediately started collecting records, manuscripts, and artifacts that would tell the story of Alabama. 
in the early days, the legislature was only meeting every four years. And when they weren't in session, the archives would use their chambers as museum space for the public to view the collections. This is a photograph of the old house chamber with some of the archival collections on display. Uh, Tom Owen always dreamed of a permanent home for the archives, but he passed away in 1920 without seeing his dream realized. After Tom Owen's death in 1920, the Archives Board of Trustees appointed his widow, Marie Bankhead Owen, as his successor. She would serve as director for the next 35 years, and she was only the second woman to head a state agency in Alabama. Miss Marie was part of the Bankhead family, which was a well-known political family from North Alabama, and she used her connections in the late 1930s to secure about a million dollars in federal New Deal funding to construct an archives building. The central portion of our building was dedicated on November 11th, 1940, as both the state archives and the state's World War I memorial building. Since 1940, we have added two additional wings to the building. The archives is conveniently located in downtown Montgomery, directly across the street from the state capitol. We are unique in that from the beginning, we have been both the state archives and the state's history museum. Most states would keep these institutions separate. <clears throat> it allows us to communicate the history of the state in a much richer way. We have a three-tiered mission, we collect, preserve and share Alabama history. We are the official government records repository for the state. All public records deemed by law to have permanent historical value are housed at the archives. We collect um, private records as well, which means we take in uh, letters, photographs, scrapbooks, family Bibles, any kind of manuscript material. Uh, and we also collect from uh, both well-known people, well-known Alabamians, and then we want to tell the story of everyday people as well. If it tells the story of Alabama's history and Alabama's people, then we are interested in collecting it. As I mentioned previously, we are home to the Museum of Alabama. It's the state's official history museum. We have been collecting for over 116 years and have over 500,000 three-dimensional artifacts in our collection. The Museum of Alabama was completely redesigned and reopened in 2014, and it features award-winning Smithsonian quality exhibits that tell the story of Alabama from prehistory to the present. We welcome thousands of visitors every year from Alabama and around the world. We have approximately 30,000 Alabama students who visit us annually um, during their field trips to Montgomery. And here is my favorite room in the whole building, the research room. The EBSCO research room is open to the public Tuesday through Saturday, 830 to 430. We have county records on microfilm for all 67 counties and 8,000 plus volume ready reference book collection. We have the largest newspaper collection in the state, and we have 11 public access computers with free access to sites like Ancestry, Fold3, History Geo, and newspapers.com. And our most valuable asset is our six reference archivists that are ready and willing to offer their expertise. Generally, our genealogy resources are gonna break down into two main categories. There are those that are accessible remotely and those that you can only use on site. Today, we're gonna to focus more heavily on the remote resources, but we do hope that you'll be able to visit us in person someday and use those on-site resources as well. Our first set of remote resources are those that are available for free right from the archives website. These tools include the Civil War Soldiers Database, the 1867 Voter Registration Database, the World War I Gold Star Database, and our MAP Database. Since 2017, we've been in the process of updating our website, and it looks like we are finally going to be able to go live with that this summer, fingers crossed. Um, nothing is going to go away. And in fact, we will be adding some databases that have never been available online before, but th things are going to look really different. So if you were to visit our website today and then to come back again later this year, this it's going to be the same uh, materials available to you. It's just going to look 
much more modern and we are super excited about that. Our next group of online resources are materials from our collections that we have digitized and then made available online. Um, so we call these our digital collections. We have digitized textual materials, various collections related to military conflicts. Um, we have digitized all of our acts, um, House and Senate journals, and the constitutions of our state government. And we have a unique collection called the 1875 Voter Registration Books, which will show um, both white and African American men who registered to vote in 1875. It, lists a lot of times it'll list not only the person's name but also their occupation and where they lived and it's just a really interesting resource if you're a paying member of ancestry.com or you have access to the library version you can find a wealth of alabama related collections that we have contributed to the site you can view these alabama specific materials by clicking on the pin dropped into alabama on the location map or by clicking the Alabama link under the map. From our page on Ancestry, you can find the Alabama State Census, Alabama military records, certain probate court collections, a portion of our surname files, and even some prison records. Alabama conducted its own censuses in 1850, 1855, and 1866. These census records are different from most of the federal census records in that they only list the head of the household and everyone else is represented by a tick mark or a number in subsequent age columns. This makes it much more difficult to locate women and minor children. Now, unless they were a part of the very small population of freed people in Alabama, African Americans won't appear by name until this 1866 state census. And the 1866 state census is also the first one generated by the state of Alabama to make a distinction between races by dividing the population schedule into white and colored sections. This example is a page of the colored population schedule of Dallas County from the 1866 census. And I just really liked this example because um, second from the bottom, you'll see an entry where uh, the woman, her name is Jane, and in lieu of giving a last name, like everyone else on the page, she just says that she is Jane, a freed woman. Various Alabama military collections have been digitized and uploaded to Ancestry. Some of the most important of these collections would be, for instance, like the Civil War muster rolls that has most Alabama regiments and companies, um, Civil War pension records that are at both the local or county and also state level, the censuses of Confederate veterans, which were conducted by the state in 1907 and 1921. And then we also have draft registration cards available for both of the World Wars. Ancestry has lumped together a whole bunch of our probate court estate records into one searchable collection. These records are taken from all 67 counties around the state, but what's available is going to vary for each county. Using this link, you'll be able to search across county boundaries and in a variety of record types, including will books, loose estate case files, probate court minutes, administrator bonds, pretty much any record type that's associated with the estate process. As with all of Ancestry's indexing, though, you do need to be careful when you rely on their search feature. These records are primarily handwritten, and Ancestry's transcriptionists are notorious for misspelling names so badly that no amount of searching will find the person you're looking for. I'm sure we've all experienced that. All right, so down at the very bottom of the list of our Ancestry.com collections, you will find the surname files. This collection is taken from our surname files on microfilm, and we have additional paper-based files as well that you can pull if you visit the archives. The surname files are arranged in folders, alphabetically by surname, and they consist primarily of various forms of clippings, um, like clippings from newspapers and other sources. We've noticed some gaps in this collection on Ancestry.com, so if you feel like there might be a page missing, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and we can pull the original microfilm and try to locate the missing section. 
Moving on to our on-site uh, resources, I would say probably the most significant and sought after genealogical records that we have are contained in our county government records on microfilm. We have records from all 67 counties in our cabinets and when the research room, uh, when you come into the research room, you can pull as many reels as you like because our cabinets are self-serve. Um, the types of records you'll find are going to vary by county and some counties might have a local register of births and deaths. Um, but a lot of a lot of counties don't have that kind of record type and the availability is going to vary for each county because of record loss throughout the years. Most counties in Alabama have encountered some kind of flood, fire, or other disaster in the last 200 years and in some cases this has resulted in a total document loss. For the counties that are still intact though, our records are mostly probate court based. You will occasionally find some circuit court records present as well. We have a searchable database on our website. All you have to do is type in the county you're interested in and you can get a master list of all the microfilm we've got for that county. One whole side of our research room is dedicated to our ready reference book collection. We've got books about individual families, military histories, histories of Alabama as a state, but probably the most important books for genealogists are the county specific books. They're arranged alphabetically by the county name and much like the microfilm, what you'll find on each county's shelf is going to vary. In general, some types of print resources you can expect to see would be probate court record indexes, like indexes to marriages, indexes to wills or deed records, cemetery inventories, local histories and reminiscences written by people from those communities, and military service memorials for various conflicts, primarily the world wars. As I mentioned way back at the beginning of the presentation, the ADAH is the designated repository for state government records, and we actively collect the permanent records of as many state agencies as we can. We're fortunate to have administrative records for all the governors of Alabama, all the way back to our first territorial governor, William Wyatt Bibb, and we have another large and regularly consulted collection um, in the Secretary of State's records, which includes legislative acts, state codes, voter registrations, and election files. We have the case files of our state level courts, both the Alabama Supreme Court and the Alabama Courts of Appeal, and we have some limited early records of our state prison system. Unfortunately, though, those are not very recent. And finally, in addition to taking in state government records, we also collect and preserve the private records of individuals. Our collections are so many and varied that it would be hard to summarize them into a few bullet points on a PowerPoint slide. But we've got everything from suffragist diaries to letters home from Confederate, um, from Civil War soldiers to movie contracts that were signed by actress Tallulah Bankhead. The list of these could go on and on. Of course, these collections became become even more important if they actually pertain to your family. So if you can trace your ancestry back to someone who was relatively well known or prominent in Alabama, I would encourage you to head to our website and search for their name in our catalog. You might be surprised what you will find. All right, so that concludes my um, presentation portion. I'll go ahead and uh, stop here. And I think we will move on to questions, Q&A. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great overview of what you guys have. And I was so excited to hear about all the different resources that are online. Oh yes, yeah. Always amazing. So somebody was asking about the maps at the beginning of your presentation. Are uh -huh. those online? Some of Are them, they... yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's a be? there's actually a map a map database, and if the map has been digitized, there will be a link in the map database that'll take you straight to it. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. And then we're gonna go to that one. Are the microfilmed county records available on FamilySearch? Some of them. 
Um, so we bought a lot of our microfilm we purchased from the GSU. And so, you know, some of that is represented online, but I would say the majority of it is not. Um, one record type that never ever seems to get digitized would be deeds. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if it's just because they're just gigantic, you know, collections or why that is. But um, if you're doing that kind of research, you pretty much have to come in uh, to use, you know, to use the microfilm. Um, I, I have, I don't think I can think of any counties where I've seen their deeds available online, Ancestry, Family Search, or anywhere. Awesome. That's good to know. Someone's wondering specifically if you have records on the, oh, I'm going to butcher this, um, what Tumka Women's Prison? Yeah. Um, so our, I would say our Department of Corrections collections are probably some of our most sparse. Um, just historically, we have not received very many, um, you know, not a, a lot of intake, I guess I should say, from the Department of Corrections. We have some very early prison records, and I mean, like by early, like 19th century, nothing recent. Um, so, you know, depending on, I'm not sure when um, the Tutwiler facility was opened. It may be too recent for us to have very many uh, records on it. Usually our, any of our Department of Correction stuff kind of starts to peter out in like the 1930s or early 1940s. Um, but I would say, you know, you can always just get on to our website, search the catalog for keywords like prison or prisoner, um, and you can see, you know, the, the resources that we do have. I would just say that a lot of what we've got is primarily like late, late 19th century, early 20th century. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Somebody said that one of their ancestors um, was a state representative in Alabama. He died in 1935. Would there be newspapers that early to have an article about his death? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, of course, it's going to depend um, on where, you know, like if he was here in Montgomery, for instance, we have a full run of the Montgomery Advertiser, which was the primary, you know, newspaper here in town. We have it starting in the 1850s all the way up to as recent as last month. Um, we have, we have actually, we have access to that on, um, on newspapers.com. And a lot of our microfilm newspapers have been digitized to newspapers.com. So if you have a subscription, you should be able to see, if you do like the publisher extra um, subscription, you should be able to see most of our newspapers up to like 1963-ish. And if you do the basic, of course, then you're kind of limited to what is not copyrighted. So that kind of cuts you off in, um, in 1923 for a lot of publications. Um, but if you're doing that kind of research, you know, it might be worth it to subscribe to the publisher extra, maybe just for a month and do all your newspapers.com searching. Um, we do, we have digitized a lot of our newspaper collection to, to that site. Awesome. And I actually misspoke. It's 1835. So very early. It's, it's entirely possible. Um, you know, you can, you can look, you can take a look at our, we have two databases on our site for newspapers, newspapers on microfilm and then paper newspapers. You can put in the county where the person, you know, lived and see all of our publications from that county and they are in chronological order. So you can see, you know, the earliest um, papers that we have. I will say for that period, it tends to be more so um, like single issues rather than, you know, whole like full runs of, of a paper, um, but you might get lucky and find that, find that one single issue that you need. So I would say just, you know, just take a look at, um, still still do take a look at what's on newspapers.com because a lot of those older papers did get microfilmed. Um, and, but, but also, you know, check out our hardbound newspaper database too, just in case. Awesome. Perfect. Um, someone's wondering if the Alabama military records are on Ancestry or Fold three. Do you have to have is it one or the other or both? 
So the way I usually kind of frame Fold3 and, and Ancestry is um, Fold3 tends to primarily pull from National Archives records. So those would be, you know, if you think of the, of the um, Confederate States of America as like a federal, a federal level government, that's primarily what you find with Fold3. And then what we have is State of Alabama records. So uh, we have, you know, that's how we have those pension records because the pension programs were run by the individual states, not by the federal government. Um, so that's why Confederate pensions are an Alabama state record and not at the National Archives, if, that's, if that makes sense. Um, so what we've digitized to Ancestry are those state, state level records that relate to Confederate service. Then Fold3 has the more national level records that document um, both Confederate and Union service. Not that we didn't have any Union soldiers here in Alabama, but you know it is it is kind of overwhelmingly Confederate records is what we've got. Thank you. So someone's wondering with the deeds, are there print indexes for most or any of the counties? Some of there are some print indexes and uh, it really just depends on whether or not some lovely volunteer has gone to the courthouse and sat down you know and typed out um, the the books there was some of that that was done during the great depression as part of the works progress administration you know they would go to courthouses and create inventories so we have some of those um, but as far as as far as deeds go, if someone was going to do that kind of research, um, you know, deeds themselves usually get you have like a master index, both direct and reverse. Um, and then you once you take a look at that master, you can identify which volumes of deeds you then need to go pull. So I would almost just suggest going straight to the microfilm in that case, um, because they, they've already kind of generated the index for you in the form of these master indexes. And then you can work from that to then go pull the microfilm that has the individual volumes that you need. Perfect, thank you. So someone's wondering um, if you could speak particularly to African-American history in Alabama, particularly during reconstruction and also pre-1865 um, during the period of enslavement. So what kind of collections are available? Okay, so um, taking the pre-1865 um, period. So unfortunately, if you're doing genealogy research in that period, uh, there really aren't a lot of records that would name African Americans individually. Um, of course, a lot of them were enslaved. And so when when you get back to that period, you're kind of having to focus on um, trying to identify potentially a white family that they were connected to, and then using that family's records to try to reconstruct as best you can. Um, so with that, you know, I usually point people to um, first, you know, starting with the slave schedules that are attached to the 1850 and 1860 censuses to identify, you know, slave owning families that maybe have the same surname, which is not always 100%, but a lot of times that's the best lead that we have. Um, so start with identifying potential matches with surnames um, in the slave schedules and then move on to the county records on microfilm and look for members of the, that family who would have died before the end of slavery because that's the only way that you're going to capture those records that uh, will name individual enslaved people. So you would be looking for things like a will or um, in the event that there wasn't a will, like the administrator's records where they're doing an inventory of the estate. And, and then also when, you know, this, the estate gets distributed among the heirs, you'll be looking for individuals and groups of people that are actually named. Um, 
And then once you move into that period of reconstruction, you start to get a lot more documentation. So that 1866 state census is one of the very first government documents that lists African Americans by name. You also have the, um, we have an early voting registration um, document that lists, you know, African American men of a certain age that registered to vote right after the end of the war. That's the 1867 voter registration database. And then the 1870 census, the federal census, is the first one where, um, you know, African Americans en masse are named. Um, you, d you will find some free people of color listed in earlier federal censuses, but, you know, they were always a very, very small portion of the population here. Um, so, you know, really 1870 is the first federal census where um, it became sort of like a goal of the census taker to enumerate African Americans, whole households, you know, by name. Um, so that, that would be the next step. And then, you know, moving forward from there, of course, you start to have access to the same the same genealogy materials that everyone else would have in, you know, marriage licenses and wills, estate cases, deeds, um, all of those sorts of county-based records, every, you know, the federal census every 10 years. Um, so once you hit 1870 and go forward, you, you really have a lot more resources to pull from. But it's really the uh, kind of like 1865 and before that where the information, the historical record is usually pretty sparse. I hope that answers your question. It's, it's kind of a big question. So hopefully I, I summarized it in a way that Thank makes you. sense. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I think you're done. Um, so we have a question about um, if you accept record requests and if so, is there a fee? Um, I'm actually looking at your website right now, clicking around, looking at all of that. So I'll let you answer, but I'm going to put some links in. Yeah, so we do uh, we do offer um, genealogy research requests for patrons. It's $15 for in-state residents and $25 for out-of-state. And um, we try to ask that people limit each request to a surname. So, you know, we, we have it set up to where you kind of identify a target person that you want us to research. And you can put in their spouse's name if you know it, their parents' names if you know it. Um, of course, when they were born and died, I would say probably the most important piece of information for us would be the county where they lived or counties um, where they lived because all of our genealogical material is organized by county first. So without that, we really don't know where to go. Um, so I would say that that would be a really important piece of information to have before you fill out the form. Um, but anyway, you give us the particulars that you already know. And then at the bottom of the form, there's a box where you can free type. If you have any specific questions or certain record types you really want us to focus on, like for instance, if you if you don't know someone's parents' names and that's really what you're trying to get, then tell us that and that will give us some direction to say, okay, these are the specific questions that we're trying to answer about this person. And then if we're able to find anything, we will send you copies of, of every document that we find. Perfect. Within awesome. reason. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the fee does cover, you know, does cover the cost of copies. Um, but if we start to get into kind of like excessive um, amounts of, of copies, we might contact you to collect some overage. Um, but for the most part, you know, we try to just um, supply what we can um, for, for, the, for those. Perfect. Thank you. Um, something else that I came across and I just want to point out is the research consultations. Um, oh, yeah. I really like that you point those out on the website. So yes. if you want to go over that really quick. Sure. So that's kind of a newer, um, a newer service that we're offering. It, it, oh, we really kind of created that with um, more of like the academic researcher in mind. So we would have, you know, like professors or grad students show up and, and they would say, you know, I need everything about uh, Governor Wallace, which is, I mean, you know, probably a good 
chunk of our storage is Governor Wallace because he was in office for so long and, and was so politically active and we have his personal papers and we have his wife's personal papers and on and on. So, you know, the, the research consultation, the spirit of it was to hopefully if we had someone that was coming that had a very broad topic, like research topic that needed help narrowing things down or just to even give us a heads up, you know, that, that we were going to have a very large request for materials coming in. Um, that's that's really what we started the consultations for is to kind of give us a heads up because the way we used to do it is we would just have people walk in and it was not very efficient for us it was not very efficient for them and so with the consultations we can have a back and forth about their project and we can identify specific collections or even down to specific boxes that they're going to need while they're here and we can go ahead and get those ready to some extent you know before they even come in um, so with that being said you know we do answer um, genealogy related questions on there um, you know if you have a question or even if you just have a question about visiting if you have a question about well, hey where do I park or um, you know how much how much would it cost to get copies of something like you can you know it's it's a we're consulting on all sorts of research <laughs> um, but that's yeah so primarily the research consultations are um, they're more so I would say designed for um, researchers that are going to come in and, and pull a lot of physical materials and it's just kind of nice to give us a heads up like hey I'm coming in and I need everything about George Wallace. <laughs> awesome and I do want to note that it does say if you want a reference archivist to conduct research on your behalf it is a research request. Correct yeah so the the difference is the research request we do it for you. You're not coming in like our, our archival staff are going to do the research for you and send you results. The consultation is you're coming in like you're physically going to come in and you just want to have a dialogue or a heads up, you know, before you physically come in for your visit. Thank you. Um, somebody's wondering if you have midwife journals. We have a small collection of midwife related materials. Um, we've actually had some individuals who were midwives um, donate their, um, you know, their own personal like private records to us. Midwifery um, was kind of, I mean, I, I don't know if it was illegal per se, um, but it just wasn't kind of like sanctioned by the state for a long period of time. And so um, there's not a lot of like state level records, state government records that record, you know, mid midwives and, and that um, profession. So it's limited what we have, but if you're interested, you can always go, you know, to our catalog and just put in like a, a keyword search like mid midwife or midwifery. Um, and you can see, you know, some of the collections that we've got. Awesome. Thank you. Um, somebody's wondering what years the cemetery inventories cover. Oh, gosh, that's uh, that's hard to say. So a lot of those were were created like um, during the Depression, like in the 30s. Um, I just seems like a lot of them were generated at that time. I guess they were just trying to employ people by having them go out and like walk the cemeteries and record what they saw. So that a lot of them were created in that period. So like 20s, 30s ish. Um, and, you know, of course, the graves that they cover are going to depend on how old is the cemetery and what tombstones were still standing at that time. Because, you know, that they, they didn't have GPR. They weren't walking the cemetery with GPR. And they typically, it doesn't even seem like they were really consulting records it just seems like they were going tombstone to tombstone and recording the information you know the inscription um, so every every inventory is a little different depends on you know the person that was conducting it their style what they consulted did you know did they look at any records or did they just straight up walk the cemetery um, and so it's it, what you get is going to depend on that person and then also the cemetery that they were working in. So it's, it's kind of hard to say generally, uh, but I will say that a lot of them were created around the 30s. Perfect. Thank you.
All right, so since we're low on time, I'm gonna go ahead and just read one more question. Um, if we didn't get to your question, guys, please feel free to shoot us an email. We'll do what we can to help you. We wanna make sure that your searches are successful. Um, so last question, how would somebody get an old Alabama County map with the original districts? Okay, so um, <clears throat> districts. Um, I would say that you, it, like I would just go to our map database and put in the county that you're looking for. And whatever comes up at the top is going to be like the oldest map we've got. Um, and again, it's going to, that kind of depends on what you mean by districts. Like, do you mean voting districts, um, enumeration districts? Like, there's not a lot of good mapping of those kinds of demarcations. And honestly, the, the enumeration districts, I don't think we have any maps of those um, like for the census until 1940. So, you know, it's um, most of the time what we have as far as maps of the county would be things like um, USGS soil survey maps, highway maps, uh, you know, just, just more kind of those types of maps that don't always show any kind of districting or precincts or, you know, beats such as the case may be. Um, and, you know, if you're trying to figure out, like, if the question is, where did someone live in the county, um, I would just remind everybody that Alabama is a public lands state, and so we have, you know, our state was surveyed into the grids with township range and section, and, um, you know, if you could figure that out, then that would be a more effective way of kind of putting someone on a modern map. If you could get township and range information um, and the township and range information never changes. It's the same exact system that they, you know, put into place in 1820. It's still the same system in 2022. Um, so if you can get that kind of information, township range section, even down to the quarter section, if possible, then then you can you can then plot that on a modern map and figure out, you know, where today where that that location would be. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Courtney, for a wonderful presentation and for being patient and answering all the questions and also for running back in after. Yeah having to evacuate the building. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for sticking with me. Um, I, again, I apologize. Uh, and I think, I think it seems like we have safely made it through without another uh, catastrophe. So, <laughs> hey, you know what? It happens. It's, it's a live program. So thank you. And I appreciate you just running back in and doing your program. So thank you, Courtney. And thank you, everybody, sure. for joining us today. And hopefully you'll join us on Thursday for our next program. Bye, everybody. Right. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody.